Hello everyone. For the second last lecture of our endocrinology series, we will be talking about disorders of the pituitary. Now I do realize that for a, a part of this, I've talked quite a bit about physiology and histology, which is which I'll tell you is not going to be assessed on your exams. You're not going to get questions about different kinds of cells in the pituitary. However, um, I've still left that in. If you want some leisurely viewing, please go ahead. But otherwise, if you're looking for more of the clinical side of things, feel free to skip to the second half of this lecture. So the pituitary is known as the master endocrine gland because it controls a lot of endocrine organs, as you probably know. But the secretions of the pituitary itself are controlled by the hypothalamus. The pituitary is located within the sphenoid bone in this tiny sac called the cella tersica. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because when we talk about operating on the pituitary, whether that's for masses or adenomas or cysts or whatever, we often adopt a transsphenoidal approach where we go up through the nose, through the sphenoid bone into the cella tersica. The other thing is it, what happens when you have a pituitary adenoma or pituitary mass compressing on other stuff, and we'll go through that later. It's suspended from the forebrain by the infundibular stalk, and this often leads to the development of two different types of tissue. In terms of its vasculature, it's extremely, extremely vascular. First, in terms of its arterial circulation, it has a superior hypophyseal artery and an inferior hypophyseal artery. And then it has its own entire portal circulation as well. Now, why is this vasculature so important? It, it, firstly, it needs a lot of blood because a lot of these hormones are almost, no, all of these hormones are transported through the blood, right? So we need a system that's very efficacious in getting those hormones to where they need to be. And secondly, we have Sheehan's disease. Now, what is Sheehan's disease or Sheehan's syndrome? And we'll talk about this as well. I keep saying we'll talk about this. I really hope I do talk about this. Um, so parts of the pituitary. This is not relevant to examinations. If you don't remember this, it is, it is fine. If you forget this two minutes after this, it is a okay So we have four basic parts. We have the anterior pituitary, and then we have the posterior pituitary, right? The anterior pituitary is divided into the pars distalis, the pars tuberalis, and the pars intermedia. The posterior pituitary is, uh, is divided into the pars nervosa and the infundibular stock. I really don't have anything else to say, <laughs> say about this. A lot of this is anatomy you would have covered in previous years, and I've added this just so it's complete, a slight revision. But again, as you can imagine, it's not the most high yield clinical content. You also have the optic chiasm that runs really, really close to the, to the pituitary. And this is relevant because when we have enlargement of the pituitary or uh, an adenoma, it can quite or commonly compress on the optic chiasm causing bitemporal hemianopia. Now, how does the pituitary communicate with the hypothalamus? It does this through two ways. We talked about the two parts of the pituitary, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. What I would like you to firstly focus on is the differences between the two. So the posterior pituitary seems to be a direct connection to the forebrain, and you'd be right in saying that, which is why a lot of the transmission between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary is nervous in origin because the nervous tissue just runs through it. And then you obviously have vasculature to get these hormones out versus the anterior pituitary, which does not have a direct connection and therefore has most of its communications with the hypothalamus through hypothalamic hormones that again circulate through this hypothalamic hypophyseal portal vessel. Histology, everyone's favorite part. Now this is important for your pathology teaching. Um, so I've added this in. We usually, as you know, go with an h &E or a hemotoxylin and eosin stain. And staining the anterior lobe demonstrates two distinct kinds of cells. You have chromophils and you have chromophobes. And this can be seen better on this slide. So your chromophils are the cells that, that take up um, h and &E stain a bit better versus chromophobes that stain poorly. And this often has to do with the number of secretory granules they have and the cytoplasm. So chromophils typically have more cytoplasm than chromophobes. In terms of the chromophils themselves, 
you have two different types of chromophylls, acidophils and basophils, depending on where they take acids up easier or bases. You need to, well, need to is subjective, but it would be good to know the various hormones produced by the acidophils and the basophils. So a good example is, uh, or a good memory tool is B flat and OGP. So B or basophils produce FSH, HLH, ACTH, and TSH. This is the acidophils or AGP that produce GH and PRL. Now, we have six main hormones and five different cell types. So the cell types are, let me, let me go through what's important here. You need to know the most common type of cells are somatotrophs, which produce GH or growth hormone. You also need to know that the second most common type of cell are your mammotrophs and your corticotrophs. So mammotrophs or lactotrophs produce prolactin and corticotrophs produce ACTH. So the name kind of makes sense. Somatotrophs, somatotropic, GH, or growth hormone, lactotrophs, prolactin, corticotrophs, ACTH, gonadotrophs, FCHLH, thyrotrophs, thyroid secreting hormone. Um, and you need to know that prolactin is the only hormone that's under dominant inhibition with dopamine. Now, the posterior pituitary consists of is rich of axon, is rich of nervous, rich in nervous tissue. It has a whole bunch of unmyelinated axons, and you you could be important to know that you have these things called herring bodies, and these are basically dilated terminal expansions of the axons, which is where you store ADH and oxytocin, which are the two main hormones released by the posterior pituitary. And again, ADH or vasopressin and oxytocin is a brief spiel about them. If you want to, please feel free to go through this in your own time. Now, what can go wrong? Now, this is really important with clinical anatomy. So, Firstly, you can have adenomas. There are most cases benign tumors of epithelial origin. Anything less than one centimeter is a microadenoma. That's the most common type versus macro that are greater than one centimeter. How do they present? So with any mass lesion in the, or any intracranial mass lesion, you can have headaches. Um, but particularly, we talked about the proximity of the cella tersica with the optic chiasm. And that is going to present with issues with vision particularly bitemporal hemianopia, where you lose the um, peripheral or lateral vision on both sides. So as name says, bi meaning both, temporal meaning of the sides or towards your temples, hemi meaning half, anopia meaning loss of vision. So you lose half the vision and that's going to be the lateral vision. Specific symptoms often depend on the type of pituitary cell being involved. So with most tumors, they tend to be anti based on the anterior pituitary, and some of them can even be secretory. So if you have a secretory tumor, that is obviously going to present with um, signs and symptoms of its specific hormone and its uh, function downstream. So if we have a prolactinoma, that is going to be a tumor that secretes prolactin. It's the most common type of pituitary tumor. In women, that would present with amenorrhea, issues with infertility, um, as well as galacteria or the production of milk. In males, it presents with issues with libido as well as erectile dysfunction. If you have a tumor that's growth hormone secreted due to a somato, um, somatotroph adenoma, that is going to cause excessive growth hormone, as you can imagine, and growth hormone causes growth. So in children, that's going to cause gigantism. In adults, it's going to cause acromegaly. Now, acromegaly is slightly different to gigantism, when you have excessive growth hormone while the kid is developing, you can have um, features like really tall height um, and everything that is typical of gigantism. However, when you've already had your growth spurt and you're an adult and now you start producing excessive GH, you have more effects on bone, um, specifically bones of the hands, the jaw, um, and the skull instead of just a growth spurt or having um, or being of a larger size. So important features of acromegaly include spade-like hands, just huge hands, 
spreading of the teeth because you have growth of the jaw, so the teeth are a bit further spaced. You have increased frontal bossing because of skull growth. Um, large nose, large ears. Um, the, this other condition called molluscum fibrosum, and you can also have cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly. We also have Cushing's disease, that is because of an ACTH secreting pituitary tumor, and it's the second most common cause of Cushing's syndrome. Now, we talk about Cushing's syndrome versus Cushing's disease excessively in our lecture on adrenal pathology. So have a look there if you're confused. Um, so yeah, um, other features that are relevant, um, it, I guess from an exam perspective, uh, here are how these are commonly assessed. So prolactin tumors or prolactinomas, the typical buzzword is milk production and sexual issues. Um, peripheral vision loss plus erectile dysfunction plus loss of libido is your go-to prolactin tumor um, in the pituitary. Your, and your typical presentation for acromegaly might be a sudden inability to fit into rings and shoes and noticing that they have issues with their jaw. Funnily enough, um, for those of you who know who the actor Kumal Nanjiani is, um, funny brown guy, he, as you know, is starring in Marvel movies now and has had a huge glow up and looks like he's put on 25 or 30 pounds of muscle in a few months. If you look at his jaw in a before and after picture, his jaw almost looks completely different. And that is because one of the anabolic substances or PDs that he was taking is growth hormone or part of it was growth hormone. And as much as he may deny that, you can see how growth hormone has had distinctive features and changes to the structure of his jaw. Go look that up, kind of fun. Other general stuff that is relevant to know, first is this thing called panhypopituitarism, where you have a reduction in the production of all pituitary hormones. And this is due, usually due to space occupying lesions. Now, fun thing, not, not again, I say fun thing, it's fun to know, but not fun to have. With tumors, you can often have a pituitary adenoma that compresses on the rest of the pituitary and causes pituitary hypofunction. Does that kind of make sense? You might have a benign non-secreting tumor that is just compressing on the rest of the pituitary and you may have low levels of all these hormones. Second is Sheehan syndrome. And I mentioned this briefly when I talked about vasculature and it's called post, um, postpartum hypopituitarism. What happens is, with women who have postpartum hemorrhage, which is a complication of labor, you obviously have low blood volume and hypovolemia that's very acute in its onset. And because the pituitary gland is such a vascular organ and requires so much blood, that sudden reduction can cause necrosis of the pituitary gland and you may end up with a necrosed gland and that would be Sheehan syndrome. You can also have diabetes insipidus and that is due to decreased action of vasopressin, and that causes polyuria. This is really bad, up to 15 to 20 liters of urine a day, and that will go hand in hand with polydipsia. So you have issues with the di or diabetic-like symptoms without actual pancreatic issues or actual insulin issues. You have two types, neurogenic and nephrogenic, depending on where the issue is. So with neurogenic diabetes insipidus, you just aren't producing enough vasopressin or ADH, with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, you are producing enough, but, it, but there's an issue with the receptors at the level of the kidneys. Um, so although you have ACT, uh, ADH levels, you are not responding to them. And the common test you can do to differentiate between the two is to give exogenous ADD, uh, ADH and see how they react. So if you, let's say, were to give ADH and they suddenly have a resolution of their symptoms that is most likely going to be neurogenic versus if they don't, is nephrogenic. And then you have sy syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion that presents with um, reduced um, urine output and is typical of um, paraneoplastic cancers or tumors. And it's characterized by hypervolemia because you are absorbing or holding back too much, vol too much fluid hyponatremia, that's often the dilutional hyponatremia, which means the actual amount of sodium in your blood is still okay, but now just you have so much fluid intravascularly 
that the concentration of sodium is dropped significantly and hypotonia that has to do with the hyponatremia and always think lung cancers. And that is the end of our lecture on pituitary pathology. Uh, thank you for coming. As, I, as always, any questions, shoot me a message and please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.